Hey guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. Today we're talking about some hard lessons we've learned about seed starting and how to do it the right way. <laughs> yeah, seed starting is one of those things that it seems really simple and in some ways it is, yeah. but there's, there's definitely some nuance to it. You're taking nature out of its natural environment <laughs> and bringing it inside generally and that that creates usually, some challenges usually out of season and out of season yeah right. so you're really creating some challenges and then you know uh i think we've accidentally then created a few of our own challenges mm -hmm. over the years and so you know i like to say that my job here at homesteading family is to make all the mistakes uh, and then figure them out so that you guys don't have to make the mistakes. And I feel like seed starting is really a place like that. I feel like I've probably made every single mistake along the line. We've made mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from <clears throat> taking my, our plants out to harden them off and then forgetting them outside during a freezing night. I've done that more than once. Um, it's just hard to remember those things once they get out of sight. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, right, that's part of permaculture is putting those things in your mode of travel. Right, and, exactly. But we're not going to quite get into all of that today, nope. but we're going to share just some of the core tips and things we've learned over the years that help make seed starting go a little better so that you can make hopefully a few less mistakes than we have. Absolutely, and end up with great transplants ready to go in, in spring. That's right. That'll be good. But first, we need some chit chat. If you're new to the pantry chat, which I know we have a lot of new listeners right now, um, know that we always do a little chit chat first, but you can jump ahead to the main topic if you want, you know, but why like, would you want to? Yeah, hang out for the chit chat. Absolutely. Life's not that rushed, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it is time stamped for you so that you can scoot ahead. So you just look at the description and you'll get the time stamp markers. You know, I get it. Sometimes I'm just looking for something, and yeah. if, especially if you're finding this like searching yes. and you're like, I just need some answers right yeah, now. Right. I, I get that. I'm, I'm <laughs> definitely that way. Just let's get to the point. So if so, we understand that. Just, just scroll on down or fast forward. Mm -hmm. and we'll get there. Anyways, what though is going on with you here this January, January 2024? 2024. I'm still getting used to saying that and not 2023. That year just flew by. Writing it's even harder. It's to a, yeah. <laughs> your, your, your neurons just get trained, right? It takes about a month for me and then I'm <laughs> then I'm in flow. Right. But uh, but yeah, here we are mid-January and life is kind of getting back into that mid-winter um, flow again. Mm -hmm. This is kind of another spot. I always say like between Thanksgiving and Christmas, there's like this magical moment to get a lot of homeschool done because we just buckle down and we just do mm. it. But yeah. then the next time is here in this like January, after kind of Christmas break, yeah, and after New break. Year's and of course, this year we had the wedding and disruption and well, weddings wedding. this year and. Uh, and then we kind of get in and we dive back in. So that's really the focus here is just diving back into normal. It's also the time of year where I look around all the areas of the household and kind of um, see those places that have been driving me crazy all year because uh, things just have piled up or built up and gotten disorganized. And it's a moment where we can take a little bit of time to have some organization projects. I'm trying Which not to look out happy. past the camera. I know. It is so bad behind the camera right now, you guys. That's next See my week. eyes wandering. <laughs> he's, he's sitting here going, yeah, <laughs> we need that. <laughs> so that's what we're working on around here is a lot of just, you know, there's we've got the wood-burning cook stove going every day to keep the house nice and toasty. Mm -hmm. And so we've been doing a lot of broths, a lot of, you know, longer boil things for meals. And it's just cozy feeling and warm. So I like enjoying that side of the year. Uh, obviously outside, not so much. There's some snow and cold and ice out there, but, uh, but it's a nice time of year to kind of slow down and tuck in a little bit and focus on those inside projects. Yeah, definitely. What about you? <laughs> you know, January is a month for planning, really. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, we've, we've celebrated the end of the year. We've reflected. We always have a tradition. We look at uh, photos on New Year's Day from the past year with yeah. our family, and that's fun to just recap, remember some good moments, and then kind of turn our eyes forward. So to me, January is really a month of planning, starting to plan the garden, 
starting to plan projects. We've certainly got a couple other podcasts on that yeah. uh, that we can link to. But um, yeah, it's really just planning. So I'm thinking about what are we doing with the garden this year? We haven't even talked yet much about that, but I've got some ideas of doing things a little bit differently to simplify. Yeah. And uh, thinking about the projects either that we need to finish outside. I'm thinking mostly outside projects. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, what can we get done this year? So... And trees. We did a big planting last year. Trees. We planted at least 19 fruit trees. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think we're going to get it all done this year, but hoping to do another planting this year. And uh, so definitely so kicking that around. So last year was like the orchard, the house orchard. Well, kind of what we call the house orchard because right. there's going to be fruit trees everywhere. I mean, there already are in multiple <laughs> areas, but that's kind of, yeah, our house orchard, which is going to provide way more than the house needs even for Probably, all of our situations. Yeah. So there's going to be some overflow mm -hmm. there. But you can't have enough trees. And for trees for us are also not just for feeding ourselves directly. Right. But that's a large opportunity to feed, uh, feed other animals, yes. like particularly pigs and chickens. So uh, we're going to be thinking nut trees and, and uh, a variety of berries and other things like that. Yay! Yeah. I think maybe we're working on the hedgerow out front this year. I don't know. That's don't one of the things we have to try gotta, to figure we out decide. because we've got quite a bit <laughs> to do. All this planning. Yeah, there's so much we can do. So that's, yeah, that's definitely one of the ones I'm mulling over. And that one I think to me is maybe sliding back. It would be nice, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's as important as getting some of our major trees in. They're slower growers and getting at least one more round of some fruit and particularly nut trees, which we Good. don't have any nut trees and we've been wanting to do that. So, If you guys have seen any tours of the garden, any of the videos where we've done tours of the main crop garden, you'll know that we have a tree nursery area in the main crop mm -hmm. garden. And those trees have been growing out there, and some of them are getting pretty they're, they're, big. They're too long. They're a little, yeah. they're a little overdue. They need to go get planted out yeah. into the, uh, the the wilds of the yard well, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and that's what those are. A lot of those are kind of our, our food forest trees. They're going to get literally put on the edge of forest mm -hmm. in different places. There are some hardy varieties that were actually been homesteaded here for 80 to 100 years. Yeah, and so we're going to tuck them in and into the nooks and crannies of the property, not so much a formal orchard. Yeah, yeah. So lots of exciting yeah, things. Yeah, good stuff. So good. just just rolling right into 2024. <laughs> just keep rolling ahead. That's yeah. what we do, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, question of the day. Sure. Got one for you here from okay. Sue Van Pattern on fill your pantry with these now. Easy to can ground beef. Mm -hmm. Check that video out if you haven't seen it. Sue's question is, what is the downside of over-pressuring, I'm not sure if she means pressurizing, you would mm -hmm. know, but over-pressuring your food? Yeah, so that would be in for canning when you're mm -hmm. uh, pressure canning and you would be over-pressurizing your food. What that means is that you're overcooking it. So, you know, when you're let me, let me back up just a little bit. When you're pressure canning food, it's because your pH in the food is not acidic enough in order to keep bacteria from growing. So that means you have to pick the temperature up of your food to 250 degrees Fahrenheit in order to reliably kill off all the bacteria that could be in your jars. So over-pressurizing, so pressure is the way we create that scenario of getting to 250 degrees in a home kitchen. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with just a boiling pot of water. It boils off and cools itself at about right. 212 degrees, depending on your elevation. Um, so to get to 250 degrees, you have to add pressure. If you under-pressurize it, it means you're not getting to 250 degrees and you might not be killing off the bacteria. If you over-pressurize it, it means you're overcooking your food, you're cooking at a higher temperature than you need, okay. and so you're overcooking it. So when it comes to something like um, ground beef or meat or broth or something like that, over-pressuring it, it's just really not that big of a deal. You'll cook it a little bit longer, but you're cooking it in a sealed container, so you're not really going to dry it out, you're not going to mess it up very much. Now, if you're talking about over-pressurizing your potatoes that you're canning, mm -hmm. you're going to turn them to mush, and they're not going to be very good. Yeah, green beans, green I beans, yeah, a anything lot of like vegetables that. Vegetables, particularly, right? 
you don't mind if your stew meat gets a little easier to chew break down <laughs> generally but yeah green beans or potatoes that are yeah. too mushy exactly yeah. if you have to choose between one or the other because you feel like you're not getting it to balance perfectly when you're getting your pressure up um, I would go slightly over pressure rather than under pressure because over pressure is safe um, yeah. but under Safer. pressure is not <laughs> so so yeah right there you have it be safe be safe good thing to do good good well great question sue and um you ready to dive in here let's dive into today's topic it, and it is january but it's time to think about seeds you guys it's the time to buy them if you haven't already you need to get on that and um, take care of that option and then get ready depending on where you're at i mean we're far north mm -hmm. idaho and so we'll be starting some things in february right the, uh, late some, into some february of our yep cool season mm -hmm. transplants that yep. go out early yep um uh, but not main crop and i think that's one of the first places we're going to start here yeah is like when to start there can be a misconception about when to start your seeds i want to back up just a little bit because if you're brand new to starting seeds or even to gardening um, I just want to let you know, we have other Pantry Chat episodes where we've de really done deep dives into understanding what seeds to buy and mm -hmm. understanding the seed packs, understanding soil and compost. Mm -hmm. We've really done in-depth ones. So you can just go to homesteadingfamily.com and go to the little search bar and put those terms in and it'll pull up your different Pantry Chats for that. So you yeah. can learn a lot there. But yeah, the, there's this misconception that earlier is better. I had this misconception and uh, you know, I, a couple years ago we had really struggled with seed starting and getting our transplants the way we wanted them. So I decided I was going to embark on this, like, let's get this set up. Right. Mm -hmm. So we got the seed starting shelves. We got the germination mats. We got the lights. We really created a whole seed starting station. And then we proceeded to have some of the worst years of seed starts ever that we'd ever done. It was like, wait, that wasn't supposed to work that way. And we had been very, and have been generally very successful, successful over the years, the but we really had a run there that uh, <laughs> caused us to at least challenge what we were doing. Absolutely. And so there were a few things that I, I think I really had to work through and that and misconceptions that I had. I don't know about you, but this is one of them. Up here in North Idaho, you know, we have such a short growing season that I was under this impression I should start things like tomatoes way earlier so that they're bigger when they go into the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's just not always true. In fact, not always true, yeah. It's, it's usually not true mm -hmm. if you're really pushing the season. Um, what we have found is really, you, for most things, you don't want to start them any longer than six weeks before you're going to get them into the ground. Yeah. There's a few exceptions, um, onions, leeks, anything in the onion family, those need a really long run up so you can start those way earlier. Peppers really do take a little bit longer. They're definitely more on the eight week to 10 week mm -hmm. side. Um, but for most things, you're really looking at about six weeks for well, your sweet spot. And let's quantify this a little bit because most people and that are growing a garden for production, mm -hmm. not for hobby, uh, are growing a significant amount of plants. Yes. Which means space is a consideration, which right. means what you're starting in is usually a smaller pot. Yes. There's some variety of sizes, but it's, it's not usually larger than two and a half inch square, three at the mm -hmm. max, usually. So that we're kind of talking in that context because right. you can start in a large pot uh -huh. early and if you have the right conditions grow a plant longer but mm -hmm. you're you're you generally most of us don't have the space for that yeah and we're not doing it that way that's very hard to manage so right. we're talking about a, a growing station like mm -hmm. you're talking about that most of us have in some form or another <laughs> however you're managing that and so they're smaller pots and so there's a limit to what that plant can do in that small pot even with fertilization and how much it can grow and so if it's too long yeah that plant's going to max out and stall out yeah Absolutely. And this is a really important thing. And um, plants kind of have this oomph that they, I don't know, I haven't figured out what the word is. Like they have this energy, some energy you know, it, going. it's growing and it's this forward moving energy. And you want to be really careful not to stall that out because as soon as right. you stall out that active growth phase, 
it, it really puts the plant backwards a long ways. It's not just like, oh, now I'll add some fertilizer or some right light or whatever it is, and then it's just gonna take back off. It really stunts the plant. So you wanna be really careful in everything you're doing with plant starting to make sure you don't slow down that active mm -hmm. growth and that, that vigorous growth that's happening. And so this is a really big part of that, is making sure that by not starting your plants too early, you're making sure that there's enough nutrients in the soil, in your small little soil starter yeah. cubes, to be able to get all the way through the growing season. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that because it's not the end of that story. Well, and let me just add, make sure that you're sizing, because a lot of this is the size. There are some other factors, but the major factor, again, is the size. So make sure that you're pot. sizing your pot to what you're doing and growing. Mm -hmm. And so most things that we're growing for the garden, unless it's, you know, some greens or certain things that's getting a little bit fringe. We don't plant those in pots usually. Well, I guess you have started to do some. I have started do doing a lot of greens in pots, So yeah. that can be a little bit different. But most of the things, you, you don't want them too small, but you don't want them too big either. Mm -hmm. So that most of ours are, what, between inch and a half and two and a half inch mm -hmm. pots. Yeah. And that's generally adequate as a general rule of thumb. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. So let's talk about the soil that mm. we're putting into that and is this a is a place biggie. that uh, maybe you guys have seen the video that I put out a couple years ago. We had the tomatoes that just weren't doing well, and I realized the mistake that had been made there, which was that the compost, which we usually, for us, we usually use a mixture of compost and topsoil for seed starting. From our own from garden, our own from garden. our own environment that we know. It's very alive, it's very bioactive, mm -hmm. lots of stuff going on there. But this particular year, the compost was frozen under a frozen tarp. We couldn't get to it mm -hmm. the way that the weather was when I wanted to start the seeds. And so I went ahead and I went to the store and I bought a seed starting mix, which seed starting mix should be sterilized. That's, that's the difference between like a potting soil and a seed starting mix. So let me add to mm -hmm. If you're buying, make sure you're using a seed starting mix, yes. not a potting mix. Yeah. Just that's where you're talking from. Right. But that, that's a very, very important thing. If you yeah. are buying it, you need to buy a seed starting mix, not a potting soil. So I took, I, I kind of combined the two methods. The methods that had been working for us with this live mm -hmm. active soil and used sterilized soil in, the pla in its place. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I didn't sterilize the pots that we had used before. And so I ended up with all sorts of problems. So there's kind of two different ways you can go mm -hmm. with this. You can either go the fully sterilized method. If you don't have active compost, you don't have you know, your, own, your own soil that's ready to go, you can use a seed starting well, mix. Well, and, and even if you do, there is a reason, I can talk about it in a minute, to, to do the sterilized. I mean, there is there is some good reasons too. So you can do the sterilized. You just have to make sure you sterilize everything. Right. You have to sterilize your pots. Um, I like the kind that you can just drop in, in boiling water, the, the silicone ones. Those are really nice. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, a little bit of bleach in water will sterilize it. And you have to use the sterilized potting mix. But you may even have to go a step further because sometimes the sterilized potting mix has been sitting who knows where for a really long yep. time and it can have started growing mold and fungus and all sorts of stuff in there. Well, and if you've been trying this for a while or been engaged in any conversations, you will have heard in the last few years that there was a commonality in people having some problems with even some of the high quality soil starting mixes that you can purchase. We don't know where they've been, where they've sat, but we experienced this online, talking to other people. Right. A lot of people, I forget what year it was, particularly two or three years ago, mm -hmm. a lot of people were having issues. You don't know where that sterilizes mix. Mix has been. So even right. though it's sterilized, it could have been sitting around for a long time. It could have been in damp, moldy environments. You don't know. So if you're going to go the sterilized route, you probably want to go ahead and re-sterilize that soil to be safe. Yeah, and to sterilize soil, you can put it into the oven in pans. Mm -hmm. At least 160, 160 to 180 degrees. Or I think you can pour boiling can pour, water pour, over pour it. Pour boiling water over it. Um, it works so as well. There's some different options yeah. for that. But you need to know that if you're going the sterilized direction, you need to be 100% sterilized. Like right. that, that's the thing you need to do. If you're going the alive option because you have really good compost and really alive, then you can 
get away with a lot more. <laughs> well, but it, here is the challenge, and I, I'm, a, I'm an alive soil proponent for this in general, but the things I've learned through you <clears throat> doing more of the seed starting the last few years and your own research and journeying and then, and then working with who's become a bit of a friend, Rick Stone, mm -hmm. uh, for the School of Traditional Skills, I, I've come to realize there is a place that I appreciate for sterilized. Mm -hmm. And you gotta remember, we're taking these plants and we're growing them indoors. It's a very different environment. Biologically, it's a different environment than it is outside. Mm -hmm. And then they're in pots. And your alive soil, you need to know the source of it, you need to know where it comes from, and you need to be very sure about it. But you're introducing that into an area that it's then gonna deal with some other issues. And this is where some of pest issues and some of the things mm -hmm. can come from. And so if you really wanna control your environment and, and kind of remove a lot of the potential threats, that's where the sterilized has validity. And I would say if you're getting started, it's, it's gonna help you be more successful. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a safer way to go. It's not the only way to go, but it is safer. And that's a lot yeah. coming from me because <laughs> I'm, I'm very big on, on using soil. But I, I used to sneak bags of uh, seed starting mix into the house. Like he's not looking quick, get it into the back room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've come around a bit and um, I, I still think compost and live soil can be good, but you need to know the source. You need to know your environment and you still need to do a lot of the other steps. Right. And, and it does introduce some complication that sterilized soil doesn't necessarily bring into the picture. Okay, we have a lot to cover, yep, so we gotta keep, keep moving. And the next one is, is that because of the size of our starter pots, you really do need to fertilize. Even, you either have to fertilize or you have to pot up regularly where you're right. replacing and adding a whole lot of new soil into those pots because you you just don't have the nutrient amount in that pot. Right. Those seedlings need a lot of nutrients once they get true leaves. Uh, until then, they're kind of living off their endosperm and you know all the nutrients packed up in their seeds. But once they get those true leaves, that takes a lot of nutrients to build plant matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're literally taking sunlight, I guess in this case it's light, not sunlight, mm -hmm. and water and the nutrients from the soil and creating all of that plant mm -hmm. mass, which is just amazing. But it takes a lot to do that. So you've got to get your plants new nutrients. And either you do that by potting up, which I find to be a pain. Well, it becomes a space issue. It becomes, becomes a lot a, of extra work. Yeah, Most of us just don't have space. the space besides the, the work and the additional soil that it takes. Or you need to fertilize. Yeah. So you would start fertilizing as soon as the true leaves appear. It's usually about 10 days post, uh, you know, uh, germination. germination. And you would use a liquid fertilizer to um, fertilize every once a week until they go mm -hmm. out into transplants. And yeah. that's, again, just to keep them in that active, uh, robust growth stage where it's really growing so that when they go into your soil, they really keep growing. They don't stall out. Well, and your seed starting mix is not nutrient dense the way your alive is. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of arguments. I'm not necessarily sure that I'm for all of it, but there is a lot of arguments that, that uh, you know, it's supposed to be lower nutrient Mm -hmm. density for the soil and then you add it in for the seed starting the and then seeds. you add it in as that seed gets starting now there's a lot of nuance in that and what's it like in nature which i'm always trying to mimic but again getting to like controlling your environment for seed starting and trying to have success this becomes a very important step and it's very helpful and what we're not saying here because it's so Im like inherent to us is whether we're talking about bringing in soil or fertilizer, we're talking about really good quality, organic, mm -hmm. something that doesn't have a bunch of synthetic, you know, fertilizers in it or anything mm -hmm. like that. So I just want to throw that out there for people who are brand new. Yeah. So, okay, the next thing. <laughs> Get your light right. Here I thought we had these great lights for our seed starting. And yet our plants were growing like as far away from the lights as they could. They were like trying to leave the light. And I, we did have good lights, but what so, I realized is we had a lot of ambient lights. So what do you mean by good lights? I think you better sort out. A lot of people okay. think you gotta go buy high end grow lights. Yeah. So let's just flesh that out for a second. You don't, you can definitely use like the old shop lights mm -hmm. or Your anything T5s, like T5s. T5s, yeah. yeah and 
there's a good reason to just use those. Instead of the T8s, which are the all spectrum. For seasonal seed starting. Yes, yeah. exactly. It, there is a difference. If you're wanting to like grow plants to flowering and fruiting mm -hmm. indoors, you need the all spectrum, spectrum lights. But if you're just trying to start your seeds indoors and get them to transplants and get them outside, then you can go with the cheaper T5 lights. There are also great uh, LED grow lights if you want a lower mm -hmm. electricity footprint um, there. Uh, and those are really good yeah. too. What you do have to know is that, especially with the LED lights, you need to read the manufacturer's directions about how high to put your light bulbs <laughs> because some of them actually cast their optimal light at different heights. If you're getting a light that's sold for... As a grow light. As a grow right, light, exactly. right. But if you're using a T5, there's a rule of thumb or, or one of your fluorescent lights. Which is? Yeah, which is an inch to... It's like an inch to two inches yeah. above the plant. Yeah. So, and probably no matter what, even, even some of your grow lights, you're going to be adjusting as the plant grows because mm -hmm. generally they need to be right close because they are not full spectrum. Right. And it's a different intensity. And so they need to be right down there over the plants and then they come up as the plant comes up. Right. Yeah, so it's important to do that and mm -hmm. get your lighting right, but it's also important, if you can, to reduce the ambient lighting. If you do this by a bright window, you will, your plants will always be going towards the bright window. They're going to try to they find know, the sunlight. They know what sunlight is. They're not, yeah. you know, they're not unintelligent in the way of, like, finding their needs. But that, lights, that sunlight is not enough. Even in yeah. most windows, even in most south-facing windows, generally, not always, it's not enough light mm -hmm. to get them what they need. Right. So you'll end up with lights, with plants that are getting leggy, even though you have grow lights on them because they're trying to get to the sunlight. So as soon as we took our whole seed starting station and we moved it back to a dark hallway, we fixed that problem right away. All of a sudden, we weren't getting the leggy plants and we weren't getting them growing at weird angles and, and all. Yeah, let me that, add. And there is one more. Well, the, that. just that's part of the height issue mm -hmm. is those lights, if you have them up too high starting your seats, they're going to reach up toward that right. light. So that can create legginess as well. Right, good. And you, you have something else you were thinking of. Um, yeah, one of our next, actually our next point here, which okay. is temperature. Some like it cool. Some like it cool, especially your plant starts. I, this is another one. I was under the impression for me that like, oh, you know, baby's warm. 70, warm. 80 degrees 70, is 80 great. 70, 80 degrees. Like, let's heat it up a little bit and keep mm -hmm. it all warm. So I got those germination mats and I stuck them under there and then the plants were by the wood-burning cook stove, which is quite warm during the day. And, um, you know, just, I mean, they were practically in a sauna. They were mm -hmm. toasty. What, what I didn't Great realize. For orchids. Yeah, really good for orchids. <laughs> Not so much for your like tomatoes or anything you're trying to start because you, they really actually don't want it. You can make them grow too fast because it's too warm. And that's not what we want. Again, we're trying to avoid that legginess well, in those plants. You're mimicking spring, right? It doesn't right. just go from no, it's cold. cold to 70, 80 degree soil. That right. takes that takes a couple months in most places yeah. to uh, do if the soil even gets that. <laughs> um, so again, as soon as we moved it to the back room, got it away from the wood burning cook stove and that ambient light, all of those things kind of came together. So you, really the rule of thumb here is you set your germination mats if you have them or you set your plant starts in a warm spot. That's another way to do it. Some mm -hmm. people use the top of the refrigerator or other warm spots in their house until they germinate. Mm -hmm. That's why they're called germination mats, not start mats or anything else. Grow mats. <laughs> Grow mats. There you go. <laughs> so um, as soon as they germinate, as soon as they germinate, you turn them off. And really ideal temperature for those plants to get go. You know, it's different for different plants. If you want to get really specific, you can look it up for each plant. They'll be like, broccoli is ideal at this temperature for the first, like, two months or mm -hmm. something like that. We're all working in our houses. We don't have ideal situations. But if you can put them back in a cool area that's like 65 degrees, low to mid 60s, it is really ideal. Yeah. That's a really good temperature. Good. Yeah. And it's it's also okay if the ambient temperature in your house if it's in your house somewhere and your ambient temperature is seventy yeah some you people keep it have. a little warmer it's fine I think the yeah. bigger point is is don't leave the germination mat on 
because your soil is going to get just way too warm. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to maintain a, a heat that's not natural. Yeah. Um, it's there to help you get a little start and get going, even though that's not natural either. Right. But you're, you're putting it there and then you're removing it once you get that start up. Absolutely. Okay. Moving right, on. Let's talk watering for a moment. Watering. I like things to be, I'm afraid I'm going to kill my plants by forgetting to water them. But because is, I have done it. <laughs> yeah, well, but it is so easy in seed starting to overwater. That's actually often the larger problem. It is. Is overwatering and then you start to create uh, mold and fungus issues. Yeah, you really do. You create a problem with that. So one thing that I learned that helps a lot is if I really watch and when the, the top dries out all the way, then I do a quick watering. So the way we start seeds is we use the seed starting trays with the little pods in them, mm -hmm. and then they're in a solid lower tray. A tray that holds water. Yeah, right? exactly. So I used to put water in and just kind of let it be there and let the water, let it kind of mm -hmm. sit in yep. the water. Likewise. Yeah. Um, and that just... Problem You're trying to problem guess problem. how much to put in to yeah. make sure it soaks it up. But not have it too much. But, you right. know, if there's a little extra, we'll just oh, let well. it stand there. Um, really, the real key is you need to water them regularly so that they don't dry out all the way down at their roots so that the root's not drying mm -hmm. out. But you water them deeply for about an hour and then you pour it off. Yeah. And that should be enough to suck it, suck it up without leaving a lot of surface moisture. Yeah. Um, which that surface moisture is where you start having a lot of problems. Well, and if you're starting to get some molds to mildew some things on top, you're, you're too moist. It's too moist. Yeah. And that's hard. I mean, if you have to make a choice between forgetting to water them, you will kill them if they dry out. They just don't have enough soil. Which they can do fast. They can do very yeah. quickly. And being a little too damp, you know, I'm going to err on the side of being a little damp because mm -hmm. a little bit, we can kind of fix a little bit of the mold problem, but... Right. It's not ideal. So trying to hit that happy balance is really the, the perfect place, the perfect spot. <laughs> I like the sweet spot. I like to call exactly. it the sweet spot. Good. Good. Well, there's a few other tips you've got here. Uh, using the fan is a really good one. Yeah, if you can get a fan, like a little oscillating tabletop fan mm -hmm. that goes on there. That I mean, one, it's going to help with that mold or the fungal mm -hmm. issues, keeping the surface dried out on your seed starts a little bit. But more than that, it's going to actually give your plants some stress so they're not wimpy. Yeah. So they don't go outside and then go, oh, there's a breeze. I think I'm going to fall over. And there's you almost <laughs> always air movement outside yeah. at certain parts of the day at least. Yeah. So inside, they're sitting like in the hallway or the bedroom or wherever it is. And there's, there's no like breeze. No <laughs> air movement. Those little plants are upright, but they don't have any strength to them. Right. Yeah. So giving them that little bit of stress that helps them to develop some strength is really good. Yep. Yeah. What about hardening off? This is certainly very important. Yeah. So hardening issue. off is where you really deal with this issue. If you have these really tender plants, they haven't ever been out in scorching sun or in, you know, hard wind or some of the different weather conditions that happen out at cold, really cold nights. Um, and so you need to help transition them from these little nursery babies that are so tender to these hard, tough plants that are going to live outside wow. in the real ground, right? <laughs> you know, and turn them into adults. Um, and so this is the process of slowly letting them spend more and more time out in the elements by getting them out into a shady spot, out of the full sun for a couple hours a day, and then bringing them back in. And then you kind of just keep increasing their exposure mm -hmm. until they're still in their little pots, still getting watered, still getting fertilized. They're still being babied, but they're doing it out in more right. elements, right? Once they get adjusted there, then they're ready to go into the soil yeah. and they're not going to have that slowing of the growth as badly because of the shock of being transplanted. And you want to take about a week to do that, mm -hmm. starting with just a couple hours in the shade and then increasing exposure to sun and length and time to where you then leave them out overnight, ideally, and, and then get them out. Now, this is one place where I really break that rule about watering. If you set them out and you get them to a point where they're ready to sit out in the sun, 
fill your bottom tray with water because yep. those trays will dry out so fast you will have dead plants after a few hours. Well, and what's happening is that plant is getting to its size that the little pot can handle, mm -hmm. you know, both in nutrient and in water absorption and everything else. And so then you're adding the sun in right. and you're, you're going to have transpiration, evaporation, everything else more yeah. quickly. So you definitely need to watch that. Right, yeah. exactly. So yeah, and then if you're growing in short seasons, don't forget to start your cold season plants early for putting out into cold frames. Yeah. You can uh, push your season when you would normally get plants out, even cool weather plants out. You can push those at least two weeks if you are using a cold frame in most circumstances. Obviously the weather has outliers. <laughs> yeah. But for the most part, if you're putting them into a cold frame, you can get even earlier by a couple of weeks. Well, what is it? We're getting things out now pre even before our last freeze, because mm -hmm. we can use frost cloth that protects from light freezes down to twenty mm seven -hmm. ish degrees. That's yeah. just with one layer. You can get even more advanced than that. But yeah. Um, and what are some of the things you're, you're doing now that you're getting out early season under those cold frames or those hoops? Yeah, kales go out really early. Some yep. Swiss chard, especially the yellow swim stemmed Swiss chard actually handles frost yep. quite well. Um, some of the winter lettuces, I don't have uh, varieties off the top of my head for you, but there are winter lettuces yep. that can do pretty well. Um, the tat soys. Those Tatsoys, are really, mustards. really good ones. Mustards do not transplant. So you can start them outside early, but I tried transplanting them. They go straight to Didn't seed. They do not like it, um, unless you're looking for mustard seed, in which case it'd be a great program. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so some of those are, are really good for starting indoors really early and getting them out under that frost cloth or in a cold frame, even before you could put those cool weather things in that can handle frost yeah. naturally. So. Yeah. Don't forget to use the edges of your season. It really yeah. extends your garden. Really does. Yeah. And those are some tips for you. That will definitely change your game. If you want to dive deeper, we actually mm -hmm. just released a full seed starting class over at School of Traditional Skills. Right. And we're doing a challenge, a, a several month challenge to help everybody get your seed starting going and get successful and work through it and do it together in a community. So. Um, that can be really helpful yeah, when you can actually do it with other people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, this, the class is done by Rick Stone, who oh, has great. spent his life developing this and teaching, I think, for the last 10 years or so okay. on seed starting. Yeah. And um, so check that out. I think we have a place we can send them yeah, to. Yeah, you can go to homesteadingfamily.com forward slash podcast dash STS seeds. I'll say it one more time for you guys if you're listening and scrambling over there. That's homesteadingfamily.com forward slash podcast dash STS seeds. And if you're watching this on YouTube or on the website, you can also see the link down below, I would imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys, it's been great hanging out with you, and I hope your seed starts go well this year uh, and you get a lot in your garden. Absolutely. Happy planting. <laughs> see, we'll you see you soon. soon. Goodbye. <laughs>